Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Liu, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, let me just say to my good friend, Mr. Ensign, uh, I am very glad that our Republican friends are concerned about the debt and the deficit. But let me just remind them, some of us voted for the war in Iraq, which will end up costing $3 trillion, wasn't paid for. Not me, not many others. Some of us voted for huge tax breaks for the rich, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars, which added to part of the problem of how under Bush we almost doubled the national debt. Some of us voted for it, some of us didn't. Some of us voted for the Medicare Part D prescription drug program written by the insurance companies that was not paid for. Some of us voted for it, some of us didn't. No, some of us didn't. Well, 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 okay, That's, I'm not, I wasn't talking about you in particular, but it did pass under Republican leadership. Some of us voted for the Wall Street bailout. A lot of that money was repaid. Some of, us, some of it wasn't. Some of us didn't vote. So before we talk about the seriousness of the debt, and I certainly agree with you, it's a serious issue, let's remember how we got there, who voted for these unpaid programs, and who didn't. But, Mr. Liu, welcome, and thank you thank very you. much for your service. Uh, Mr. En Senator Ensign and, and Senator Alexander and others are absolutely right. Debt is a very serious problem. We have to deal with it. But it's one of many problems. Among other things, the middle class in America is collapsing. Poverty is increasing. When President Bush was president, the middle class saw a $2,000 a year decline in medium family income. The issue I want to talk about, which I hear very little discussion about, and I want your views on, is the fact that the United States today has the most unequal distribution of income and wealth of any major country on Earth. Sometimes we talk about the economy like we're all in this together. We clearly are not. Now, I want your judgment, and tell me what you think. In 2007, the wealthiest 1% earned 23.5% of all income in America. In the 1970s, that number was 8%. Top 1% in the 70s earned 8%. Top 1% now is earning almost 24% of all income. Do you think that that is okay? Do you think that that is an issue that the president should focus on? Do you think it's morally okay? Do you think it's economically okay? You know, I, I think that the, the uh, distribution of income um, is a challenge and a problem, and it's something that uh, we need to focus on. I think as a matter of federal policy, it's really one of the things that drives the debate on whether or not to extend the tax cuts for people earning over $250,000 a year. Um, th that would be the wrong thing to do at a time when we have the disparity of income distribution that you're describing. I think that the, the real challenge we face is how to grow the economy, grow jobs, create the kinds of better income earning opportunities for more working Americans. But uh, we certainly agree, and that's what everybody says, but the reality is, over the last 30 years, almost all of the new income created has gone to the top 1%. And in fact, today, top one-tenth of 1% earns 11% of the income. Do you think that that is morally acceptable? I think that uh, there, it is very important that we focus on uh, what are the income levels of working Americans, uh, middle-income Americans, um, and the, the decline of incomes uh, is not a good thing. In your judgment, and, and certainly it was exacerbated during the Bush years, but it would be wrong to say it was only the Bush years, why has, over the last 30 years, the middle class collapsed or, or, or significantly declined, the rich become much richer, and poverty increased in America. In your judgment, why I, is that happening? I think that there have been trends in our economy that have um, done tremendous damage to the manufacturing base of the economy. Uh, the loss of manufacturing jobs has had a lot to do with it. Um, I think that we have, uh, we, 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 we need to look at the kinds of trends that you're talking about and ask how do our policies affect that, if our policies affect that. I know I, over the years I've worked hard on things like Tax, earned income tax credits to address issues like that. There are federal responses that have been very effective, though not effective enough because- If I can, I'm sorry, you know, time is short. Yeah. Um, you, you touch on manufacturing. I think that's an extremely important point. I think you're right. I know in my state, which is not a major manufacturing state, we've lost about 25% of our manufacturing jobs in the last six years. I think under Bush, we lost over 4 million manufacturing jobs. Many of us <clears throat> believe that one of the reasons, not the only reason, is a disastrous trade policy, which has basically said to corporate America, 
Of course, you can throw American workers out on the street, hire people in China for 50 cents an hour, and bring your product back into this country. So, I mean, I myself voted against NAFTA, permanent normal trade relations with China, and so forth and so on. What do you think about trade policies? Are they working, or have they helped destroy manufacturing in America? I think that uh, it is important that we um, we look at these issues uh, for both the, the benefits that come from uh, enhanced trade, free trade, and the potential costs. You they're, think the benefits have outweighed I, the losses? I think that the risk to the United States of closing off from the I, world I did, That wasn't the question. Yeah. Like, going back in history, do you think the unfettered free trade policies that have gone on from Reagan on the Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. have benefited the American worker? or hurt the American worker? I think to, for a worker who's lost their job. Uh, Wasn't my question. Of, Is it, of course, for a worker. I, 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 can't, I can't speak uh, to the statistical uh, averages. I'd have to go back and look at them. My understanding of the trade policies has been there have been many benefits as well as costs. I think the costs are things we have to focus on. We have to look at the reason. We have to ask the question, are, is that because of unfair policies? Is that because of I laws? I think the reason is not that complicated. Yeah. When you can hire people for 30 cents an hour, that's a pretty good reason to go abroad, and that's what people are But our, our, I think it's very important as we look at trade agreements to ask whether the kinds of laws that protect worker rights, the kinds of laws that protect uh, environmental standards right. are in effect. We heard that on the President yeah. Clinton as well. He was wrong then, and I'm afraid those who are touting that line are wrong today. We are in the midst of a horrendous recession right now. 16% of our people are unemployed or underemployed. <laughs> Clearly, the immediate precipitating factor was the collapse on Wall Street. Do you believe that the deregulation of Wall Street pushed by people like Alan Greenspan, Robert Rubin, contributed significantly to the disaster we saw on Wall Street several years ago? Senator, I, I, as when we discussed, I mentioned to you, I, I, I don't consider myself an expert in, uh, in some of these aspects of the financial industry. My experience in the financial industry has been as a manager, not as a, an investment advisor. Um, my, my sense is, as someone who has you know, generally been familiar with these trends, is that the, the problems in the financial industry preceded uh, deregulation. There was a, an increasing emphasis on highly abstract leverage derivative products that got us to the point that in the period of time leading up to the financial crisis, risks were taken, they weren't fully embraced, they weren't well understood. I don't personally know the extent to which deregulation drove it, but I don't believe that deregulation was the, 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 the you know, proximate cause. Um, I, I would defer to others who are more expert uh, about the industry to try and parse it better than that. Thank you, Mr. Liu, and thank you for the extra time, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me just say, I think these are very important points. I mean, my own assessment of what led to the collapse was a combination, really a toxic brew of overly loose fiscal policy, an explosion of debt in the previous administration when times were good, an overly loose fiscal policy following 9-11, the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates abnormally low for an extended period of time, and the result being an overly loose fiscal policy and an overly loose monetary policy at the same time, something you rarely see in economic history, coupled with deregulation. I think the Senator is entirely right. I think deregulation, part of that toxic brew, has a central responsibility in the near collapse. And I don't, I don't know how it can be otherwise. We had uh, trillions of dollars of derivatives, exotic insurance products uh, that were deployed to try to defend against people taking outsized risks. Major financial houses that weren't satisfied with 11 to 1 leverage wanted 30 to 1 leverage and got 30 to 1 leverage under the previous administration. Got 30 to 1 leverage. It works great when things are going up. Doesn't work so good when things are going down. And the, other, the previous administration looked the other way. I absolutely did. I think the economic history of it is clear. I just read the book, by the way, The Big Short. If you want an interesting education in what occurred, uh, read that book, The Big Short. 